Hello and welcome to this uh, briefing introductory webinar for the International Compliance Association uh, Diploma in Anti-Money Laundering. My name is Becca Dare and I am a Director of International Compliance Training. So today we're going to look at the International Diploma in AML and I'm going to talk about the syllabus of the course, the, the, the coverage of the program and we're also going to talk about your journey through the program, what to expect uh, in terms of the workshops, the assignments and exam, and the overall approach to assessment, and maybe some ideas about how to uh, approach your studying. Okay, so in terms of the course as a whole, you, uh, if you're doing the course on a face-to-face -face basis, you will have four one-day workshops, uh, which will be delivered by an experienced industry practitioner. Uh, it is also possible to undertake the program by distance learning and if you're undertaking that option you'll receive additional web-based uh, support, webinars that are filmed per module as well as a course um, workbook and remote tutor support. There will be two written assignments during the program and we'll look at those as well as well as a, a three hour 15 minutes open book examination at the end of the course. And the course will typically take nine months to complete. Okay, so in terms of the actual syllabus itself, the program is, is divided into six modules, which in turn uh, is broken down further into a number of units. So the first module is really about putting the subject matter into context. So we'll look at what money laundering actually means, both in terms of the law as well as actually the latest thinking in how, for example, organized crime and corrupt politicians actually conceal and structure transactions to uh, evade detection by law enforcement and maintain their lifestyles. Um, we'll look at terrorist financing and explore some of the latest thoughts on, uh, on techniques used by uh, organized uh, terrorist groups as well. Then we'll also go and look at the, the bigger picture in terms of the international frameworks. So who are the leading international organizations uh, that have an impact on anti-money laundering? Uh, obviously, we'll focus on groups such as the United Nations, the Financial Action Task Force, and the European Union. Uh, but we'll not just look at the legal frameworks, we'll look at the practical impacts that these organizations have and how as practitioners, we can use information and tools provided by these organizations in our day jobs. We'll also then drill down and look at, in a range of key jurisdictions, the money laundering and terrorist financing legal and regulatory frameworks. If uh, you are studying uh, in a, a specific jurisdiction, you also have the ability to research and develop a deeper knowledge of your own jurisdiction's legal and regulatory framework. Finally, in Unit 1, we'll explore the vulnerabilities of different sectors and products to, to money laundering and terrorist financing, from retail banking to insurance to investment services to betting and gaming to new payment systems, uh, electronic commerce. We'll explore all of these topics. Then we move on and explore the vitally important area of customer due diligence. Very, very uh, focused um, uh, topic in terms of the attention of regulators at the moment. And the depth of information required now has dramatically increased in the last few years. There's a real expectation that customer due diligence is done in a meaningful way, particularly in respect of high risk customers so we will explore what best practice looks like in terms of identifying and verifying the source of wealth of customers. We'll talk about the risk-based approach to customer due diligence. And we'll explore issues such as unwrapping corporate structures to identify ultimate beneficial owners. We'll also then move on to explore sanctions compliance. Financial sanctions, trade sanctions, these are the lists uh, provided by uh, international organizations and jurisdictions uh, prescribing certain individuals and entities and even jurisdictions with whom we must not uh, engage on a financial level. Uh, the challenges of implementing these regimes are of course 
are very, very high, and the consequences of failure are potentially catastrophic. And we'll explore the challenges and issues around compliance with financial sanctions in the, in the program. We'll also then explore the risk-based approach to anti-money laundering. How do you design a risk-based approach? What is a risk-based approach in practice? Um, how do you ensure that your controls are properly allocated to the risks that you actually face? Linked to that is how do you ensure issues are escalated correctly? And what about exiting relationships uh, which you consider to be problematic or unduly, uh, unduly uh, high risk? Of course, any set of controls or systems falls apart if senior management does not fully engage. So we'll talk about the, the crucial role of senior management and the whole governance framework around anti-money laundering. What committee structures should you have in place? How can you demonstrate on a practical level the right culture in your organisation? A big aspect of this is obviously training and awareness and we'll explore the, the, the do's and don'ts in this area and look at some practical suggestions. The final module focuses on the inherently fascinating area of suspicious activity. So how do you identify red flags of suspicious activity? How do you get people in an organisation to report suspicious activity? Uh, what are the approaches you should take? Uh, what are the legal requirements? But more importantly, on the ground, how do you actually ensure compliance with the law? Uh, this includes looking at the use of automated systems as well as human beings reporting suspicious activity. And of course, it's not just uh, reviewing and deciding whether suspicious activity should be reported to your Financial Intelligence Unit, or FIU. There's the huge range of issues you need to consider after a suspicious activity report has been submitted to an FIU. What do you do with a customer? You obviously must not tip off the customer. Should you seek to exit that relationship? What happens if the customer wishes to undertake further transactions of which you are suspicious? Uh, these range of issues will be explored uh, in the program. We'll also talk about the approach you should take when dealing with requests for information in respect of customers from law enforcement. So the workshops themselves are extremely engaging and uh, a very, very practically focused. We'll focus on a range of topics. Uh, there will be lots of group exercises, case studies, discussions, and debate. They are run in typically small groups and are highly interactive. A great opportunity to enhance your peer group contacts as well and develop networking. The assignments, there are two to be submitted during the program, and they must be between two and a half and three and a half thousand words. You have a 12 week period to uh, undertake each assignment, and we give you plenty of support. We're conscious that a lot of people are coming to this qualification having not studied at this level for years, or perhaps even ever. So we will give you plenty of advice and support in terms of how to write an assignment, how to reference, and how to undertake research. And there are a range of support mechanisms available uh, in that regard. So in terms of the advice around structuring uh, your papers, the uh, advice will focus on ensuring you fully understand the question and structuring your answer in a coherent, logical fashion. Um, we have the ability to brainstorm ideas and indeed, we also uh, provide a mentor uh, scheme where if you wish to have an experienced industry practitioner to provide you feedback and support during your studies, we can facilitate that for you. So to give you an idea of the type of, and depth of questions that are typically posed during the assignments, we have an example here. Uh, you can see the question asks or puts you in the position of being an anti-money laundering consultant being advised to uh, being asked to advise a firm operating in a sector and jurisdiction of your choice. Important to emphasize this, uh, the course will often enable you to select a jurisdiction of which you are familiar, and indeed even an industry sector uh, to which you have been exposed. The, uh, the program is uh, also able to 
um, help you explore practical applications of issues. And here you can see that the paper asks you to produce a briefing paper. So we'll give you advice on maybe what a briefing paper should and could look like for, for senior management. Okay. Um, again, the question is all about the uh, improving anti-money laundering knowledge as well as the suspicious activity reporting controls. Uh, the specific topics uh, that you've been asked to report and focus on uh, include the influence of international frameworks, the concept of dual and single criminality, what the word suspicion means, what is the test of suspicion, and the importance of recognising red flags. Okay, and again, we'll uh, provide you feedback and advice during, the, during your studies about the topics you would need to cover in answering a question such as this. The exam at the end of the program will be a three-hour open book examination with 15 minutes reading time. Uh, it is open book, so effectively, as the name suggests, you can take in essentially any written material at all. That includes your course manual, your own notes, and even your previous assignments. Answer frameworks are fine. The only thing you're not able to take in is electronic devices and electronic media such as iPads or laptops. The, the exam is broken down into two sections. Uh, you must pick four out of eight questions. Two of the uh, questions must be uh, more theoretical or essay style questions. And you must pick two out of four case study style questions. Okay, so to give you an idea of the type and format of the exam questions, here are a couple of, of practical examples. Um, the first one here is a question around the role of the money laundering reporting officer or compliance officer uh, and talking about producing a, uh, a, an annual report uh, as part of that role in terms of how effective the money laundering function is in an organisation. Um, the question then goes on to ask you to explain the status of the role of money laundering reporting officer in a jurisdiction of your choice uh, and outline the specific regulatory requirements, if any, that relate to that role. Uh, part B asks you to include an evaluation of the most important elements that the annual money laundering report should include specifying any issues within systems and controls that you regard as the most significant. Okay. Another example here is taken from the case study section of the examination. And you can see you have a, a series of facts and you're asked to outline the potential offences, risks or issues that relate to those facts. And again, during the course, we will think widely when we think about risks, and there are a, a huge range of risks in this scenario. So you have a scenario involving a client relationship manager in a financial services organization being approached to open up an account. Um, the client manager becomes suspicious during the um, conversation uh, that goes ahead anyway. Uh, we also have the role of a compliance officer, and he's discovering that there is no AML training in place uh, and a general lack of awareness in the organisation, and indeed what appears to be a negative culture. And you're asked to consider the wider risks and issues uh, in, in respect of, of both of these scenarios. So, again, we will give you advice and prepare you for the examination during the course uh, to ensure that you're, you're fully um, ready for the day when it arrives. So in terms of uh, planning your studies, uh, there is a lot of support in terms of both the course guide and the study handbook itself. It contains self-assessment questions, advice on exam study and assignment writing. Um, and again, in terms of planning your study to ensure the work-life balance is maintained, we will give you lots of advice as we go through the, as we go through the program. A key aspect of the course will be your own reading and note-taking. And we encourage you to undertake independent research. Uh, we will give you lots of further reading and research materials to develop your knowledge and deepen that knowledge. We'll ask you and we'll give you the ability to look at your own organisation as well, uh, as well as uh, primary legislation, industry guidance and uh, research into the subject matter. 
to uh, focus on the assessment itself, the overall pass mark for the course is 50%. Uh, half of the overall mark of the course rests on the two assignments, and 50% of the, the remaining 50% of the marks for the course uh, rest on the exam itself. The program can be awarded on successful completion with a pass, merit or distinction grade. Thank you for your attention. So if you have any uh, further uh, questions or queries, feel free to contact the International Compliance Association. We have the web address there. Of course, I have my personal uh, contact details on both Twitter and email as well. Uh, thank you very much for your time. And I look forward to seeing you all uh, on ICO programs in the future. Thank you.